Husband say he is uh, basically more urban or rural. Kathy? I don't know what they mean. <laughs> well, you know it. Uh, I mean, you married him. What do you think? Uh, uh, yeah, he's urban. He's urban? Yeah. How long has he been that way? <laughs> About two months. Two months he's been there. Do you, you think there's anything he can do about it? He went to a doctor. Oh, he did. <laughs> did did uh, the doctor give him anything for his urban? He gave me something. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Number one, we were given a bedroom. But what about that dirty old shed? Eric's number one is where I lived for three and a half years with my family. The bedroom we were given was at one time my children's bedroom. My daughter and my son-in-law lived in this house presently. In May, my husband came into barracks number one with our youngest son, Stephen. Oops. Here we have her son, when she never saw or talked with her children. Who had become a behavior problem for the generals during the period of my confinement. Confinement? Laura spends page after page in her testimony under oath, telling us about all the work she was made to do and about several other living quarters she lived in. Confined? Yeah, right. He said that I was no longer to work at the art shop, but I was to stay home and take care of Stephen. Wait just a minute, folks. Poor Mara Schmier. I thought she had no money. No one worked at the art shops without getting paid. Even she admits this. And here we have her husband telling her to stop working at the art shop. Which means she must have been working there during her imprisonment. Duh. In order to take care of his son, she tells the court and the media that she never got to see or talk to him. For four months, Jackie and I had a total of $20 for spending. I used to collect rags because I had no money to buy and napkins. Wait another minute, folks. How could this prisoner collect rags while being locked up for six months? He said that Stephen was to eat with me. But, but, I thought you and Jackie were locked up in a dirty old shed for six months. And ate only stale peanut butter sandwiches every day. No kids. For the two and one half months, we were forced to live in the shed. We were only given six stale white bread, peanut butter sandwiches per day. Nothing else. Our sandwiches were always stuffed in a plastic bag and left at our dirt doorstep during different hours of the day, sometimes not until almost the end of the workday. At times I would get so hungry from working so hard at the art shops or in the camp, Mara, that I resorted to eating out of the camp's garbage cans. I went from a size 10 to a size 5 skirt in three months. That be it all. She tells us that she was virtually locked up as one newspaper quoted her. And now she tells us that we made her, sorry, ordered her to work. Turn to page 12 of trilogy number one of three. We read Leela's testimony. Mara's diet and habit. Mara at this point requested that her food portion be cut as she said that she was not getting enough exercise and was getting fat. So, as I inquired what she wanted to eat, she 
said she would like peanut butter sandwiches. We accommodated her with peanut butter sandwiches for lunch. For her breakfast and dinner, she was allowed to eat of the provision that everyone else had. It was her choice to eat the sandwiches for lunch. But the provision for lunch often included fresh fruits and sometimes cookies or carrots also. So I did not want them to be bored eating the peanut butter sandwiches. Several times I asked them if they wanted something else. They replied no. They loved their peanut butter. During this time, Mara and the other woman, Jackie Rankin, often asked for work outside, declaring that they wanted to do those things that would benefit others. Mara insisted that she wash her clothing in a bucket and take her showers with a bucket as she said that it was good training and that she had the opportunity to be a missionary during this time. After a while, we thought it better to arrange for both of the women to work in the art shops where they could receive paychecks for their labors. We felt this better as Mara would spend hours in the yard pulling a few weeds and sitting in positions that were unbecoming with the legs spread open while she was wearing skirts, behaving in lewd manners, hoping some of the young men should come and talk to her. During this time, she and her husband talked about and agreed upon a divorce. She willingly signed the papers and excitedly commented to another young man, quote, At last, I'm free! Mara exclaimed, I'm free! We did not know of the divorce plans until after the papers were signed and the husband reported it to me. I was literally shocked because I had hoped they would reconcile the relationship and that they would be accepting of each other again. But he assured me that they had come to a mutual agreement that he was to have custody of the children, which seemed right in as much as she was at times very neglectful of them. Slow down and make help me out. Help me out. No, 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 using the children as a shield. I've written that Marshmere never really did care for her children, but after the lawsuit she makes mention of them in an oh so loving manner. She just used them as a shield to protect her from being branded as or accused of being a neglectful mother. As we know, Mara's daughter Rebecca, formerly Iantha, wrote a long history about her life before and within the ministry. This was written while most of us moved out of Fort Freedom in Sacramento up to Camp Gilgal in Biggs, California. Unfortunately, later on, as we have mentioned elsewhere, when we were being driven out of California, Rebecca defected from the ministry. Yet this does not discredit the truth contained in her revealing essay. Hi, Marty Wolf Pictures, please. Marty Wolf Pictures. Astrid Barker, please. Speaking. This is Doris Del Rio down in parking. Do you drive a Saturn, ma'am? Yes. Well, it's, um... It's parked on the dock. I'm not going to say that. Come on. Hello? Your car's parked on the dock. Your car's parked on a dock. Rebecca's essay, a notarized statement called $20 Million Lie Exposed, is a powerful testimony against Mara's attempt to use the children as a shield and provides us with a number of other striking insights. I want to pick out a few notarized statements from Rebecca's essay pertaining to the nature of this issue. Don't die! Oh my God, just stay just Keep breathing! Think of a happy place! When my mother was supposedly locked up, she had her own money, access to telephones, freedom to go to the grocery store or anywhere else she wanted, whenever she wanted. Police officers were within the compound during her supposed imprisonment and saw her free. In fact, she even lifted her hands at the police at one point. Child abuse detectives who were there to investigate rumors of child abuse started by Virginia Gudino, who claims her 22-year-old daughter is a captive. The detectives found Mara Fine sitting in the backyard enjoying her lunch. Also, Sergeant Reedy, of the Sacramento Police Department was within the compound and saw the same woman free and quite capable of making her own decisions. He is willing to testify on our behalf. She was able with her own resources to purchase sanitary pads and if she used rags it is because of her own uncleanness. Not anyone else asking her to do that. Rebecca 
Sarah's experience with and relationship to her mother makes her statement unquestionably authoritative. Rebecca Warren's the essay was presented to a multitude of news media reporters who interviewed the generals on video in 1989. However, the information contained in Rebecca's statement did not seem to get much publicity. According to eyewitnesses, when Mara Schmier was confronted about the facts contained in her own daughter's powerfully exposing statement, Mara replied that she did not believe that her daughter wrote the statement. Mara proceeded to claim, reportedly, that General Deborah Green had written the statement. As a notarized statement, this document holds an unshaking authority in respect to the authenticity of the author, Rebecca Warren. Eyewitnesses can also verify that Rebecca Warren is the author, and so the truth is still testifying. Note, sadly, Rebecca Warren defected from the ministry after several years of dedicated service. However, this does not negate the bold truth presented in this poignant, notarized statement. Dad, I'm serious. That guy stole my paper. You have to believe me. I can't. I just don't trust you right now, Jace. Commonly repeated lies. ACMTC Leaders practice brainwashing. Come on, man. I'm really tired of hearing this one. Please define brainwashing, folks. If you are denoting generals as cruel communists, you are horribly deceived and have believed a lie. That is insane. The generals help people to think on whatsoever is true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, or virtue of praise. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. This is biblical. Christians are commanded to think on these things, and Christian leaders are commanded to admonish everyone in such sound doctrine. Titus chapter 2, verse 1, and 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses, verses 1 through 2. Those who slander the generals are usually avid TV watchers. It's not our policy to keep up with such things. If there has been any medium by which the masses in this nation have been brainwashed to believe certain philosophies, it has been the medium of television. This is the world we live in. Just something to think about. Food companies spend fortunes on advertising, trying to brainwash people to buy their products. Why don't the accusers slander all advertising companies? Placracy at its finest. Accusations about brainwashing are merely attempts to discredit the generals in ACMTC without any factual evidence. It's all the unsubstantiated hype. This hype surrounding the idea of brainwashing makes for a good melodrama, but it does not hold together under reasonable scrutiny. Lie number two. ACMTC practices kidnapping and abusing children. What? Syria. 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 Quote from the Gridley Biggs Richvale Ministerial Association answers this allegation well. Against the above charge, the minister said, quote, Please folks, don't get them, ACMTC, mixed up with other groups that we have heard of. While in Sacramento, ACMTC was twice visited by Child Protection Agency workers who had come to address the above allegations, especially child abuse and neglect. The CPA workers determined the allegations were absolutely false and no one filed charges. Consider also the following quote from Sergeant William Elliott of the Butte County Sheriff's Department. This quote was cited in the May 3, 1989 issue of the Gridley Herald. Quote, the Sheriff's Department says the ACMTC as just another religious group involved in no criminal activity that I know of. Gridley Mayor Thomas E. Crampton said the same thing. I haven't seen them do anything wrong. Quoted in the Sacramento Bee, Sunday, May 7th, 1989. Now why do people not pay attention to verified statements like that? Get him, Bruce. Think. 
If the above allegations were true, would not ACMTC have been shut down long ago? Kidnapping and child abuse are criminal charges. The generals would already have been locked up if the accusers had even one minuscule shred of evidence to support their claims. <laughs>